You're listening to From the Chair, and I'm your host, Mike Hamilton. Join us each episode as we talk to athletic directors from across America. We're going to talk about topics like leadership, career development, issues of the day, and I can promise you we're going to have some fun along the way, too. So sit back, listen in, and let's dive in. Let's go. All right, welcome into today's episode. My guest is the Director of Athletics at Army West Point, Mike Buddy. Mike, thanks for, uh, for hopping on with us today. Absolutely, Mike. Happy to do it. No such thing as uh, bad publicity or bad podcasts. <laughs> well, let's hope so, right? Uh, it should be great. And as I mentioned to you off off the air, um, I want to I want to visit with you about a couple things. Uh, obviously, your early career and your time that you spent in baseball. But then I want to shift the, at the end of our interview uh, the lion's share of our time to specifically your role there um, at at Army. Um, and so you and I, I think we've talked about this uh, before, Mike, but, but um, you know, I was working at Wake Forest when you were a student athlete and on the baseball team there in the very early 90s. And, and obviously you were a key member of our baseball program there. And so it's been, it's been fun to watch your career, uh, maybe not intimately involved in your career over these, all these years, but certainly to have watched it and kept up with what you've been doing and, and the success that you've had along the way. And I know that I remember when you were actually drafted out of Wake Forest and, and uh, entered your time in, into baseball. And if I recall correctly, you actually were drafted by the Yankees initially, right? That's right. Yeah. So um, I want to jump into that. Then we're going to talk about how you, how you came back to athletic administration. So you, you went to the – you were in the Yankees organization for a period of time. And like everybody who's in, in, uh, in baseball, uh, you, you – uh, you find your way, right? You play in the, the minor leagues, you play in different competitions and with the hope that someday you're going to get to the show. And you're one of those fortunate uh, guys who, who made it to the show and played uh, in the MLB for the Yankees and the Brewers for some time and, and had success. And so talk to me just about, you know, coming to Wake Forest as a student athlete in the ACC, you're playing baseball, you're drafted fairly highly, and then you spend a number of years in both the minors and then then ultimately in MLB, how is that informative to who you've become as a leader and maybe your thought process that you, of things you learned athletically uh, from an administration standpoint and being around Major League Baseball? And then I'm gonna ask you a couple of specific questions around your time with the Yankees, if we, if we can. Yeah, so, um, you know, certainly, as you mentioned, a, a unique route to get into to where I am today. And, and I do feel like any athletic administrator, you know, the, the qualities that you need to have, especially today, in terms of thick skin and resilience and humility, you know, all of those things, especially when you're an, an average professional pitcher, right? I mean, humility, you get instant feedback. You know, when a guy hits a double off the left field wall, you know, it was a pretty crappy pitch. And so, you know, th those experiences certainly shaped me. Um, you know, Mike, when, when we were at Wake Forest, you know, there were eight schools in the ACC. Um, there was about 3,200 students at Wake Forest. And, you know, this, this current era of college athletics wasn't even, you know, a, a consideration. And so, you know, I felt really fortunate uh, growing up in Cleveland, Ohio, pitching in the snow. I was so excited to, to head south where, where the weather was much more conducive. Um, I had a brother who went to Duke, so I knew the ACC and, and knew the landscape um, of the academic uh, focus at Wake Forest. But then also they were kind of an up and coming, you know, we weren't Clemson or North Carolina, Georgia Tech, who were really good baseball schools at the time. But, but I knew I would get to pitch against all of those schools. And that's, that's kind of been my mentality, Mike, throughout, not just, uh, you know, in college, but I kind of had the chip on my shoulder. You know, nobody really recruited me out of, out of Cleveland. You know, and then I was the second pick that, of the Yankees draft in 1992, uh, the first pick that they, they wasted on some high school shortstop from Kalamazoo, Michigan, who uh, I don't know. I don't know what ended up happening to that guy, Jeter. Um, but, you know, same thing when I got into professional baseball, you know, I, I always I, I tell people I just had this minor league mentality. And so whether you started in business or in advertising or in development or in minor league baseball, in my case, you just learn that you better wake up every day focused on what are the little things that I can do that are going to make me better, that are going to give me that opportunity to get out of A ball and into double A or get out of double A and into triple A or ultimately 
get the opportunity to, to pitch in the big leagues. And that took me seven years. Um, seven years is a long time to be in the minor leagues before you get a chance. I stayed healthy for a long time. Um, like in most of our careers, I had a couple key people within the Yankee organization who, you know, when it became time to, to say, hey, who's, who deserves the opportunity? You know, there's seven or eight right-handed relievers that, that are on the list. And for me, it came down to having a couple guys in the room who believed in me, who knew that I wasn't going to miss curfew. They knew I wasn't going to, you know, yell at fans. They knew that I knew the pickoff plays and the bunt defenses and, you know, all of those little things um, that when you're at, at a level like that can be the differentiation between are you stuck in AAA or are you going to get an opportunity to pitch in the big leagues? And, and I feel very fortunate that I was given that opportunity. Are there any learning? You played for a couple different franchises. Were there lessons learned about, you know, the game is the same between the lines, right? But you've got different personnel. You've got, but, but outside the lines, you've also got different ways that, you, that ownership and management uh, manage a franchise. And you played for the Yankees and you played for the Brewers, uh, both at the MLB level. Um, what are the nuances that you saw just in that you, you had learning lessons from as it relates to doing the same task? I'm really what I'm trying to do is extrapolate this to the fact that now, Mike, there are different universities, but when you strap it up and you play football on Saturday, you're playing basketball on whatever night you play basketball, um, it's between the lines, right? But there are different ways you manage your business outside the lines. Learning lessons from, from that at the highest level from playing from two different, very successful franchises? Well, you know, I read somewhere, I forget, I forget who to attribute it to, but, but I read that a good leader defines reality. And, and, and I believe as an athletic director, part of my role is to define that reality. Um, you know, is it realistic for us to think that we are going to beat Alabama in football? Um, that's probably a stretch, but is it realistic to think that we can beat Syracuse in lacrosse Absolutely, because the reality of, of our lacrosse program is defined differently than football. Um, and so I would say, you know, one of the great traits of Joe Torre when he was the manager that I played for the New York Yankees is he defined our reality. And that reality was we either win the World Series or we have failed. Um, and you, you know, you, you compare that to my time in the Milwaukee Brewers organization where it was, for the most part, young kids getting their first taste, getting an opportunity trying to, to be part of the community in Milwaukee. Um, we were not expected to make the playoffs. And as, as you would imagine, we didn't make the playoffs. But, but a big part of me was, um, and I was, I, I was 27 or 28 when I made my debut, which, you know, a, a mature uh, outlook um, for, for that age. And, and I knew what my role was. And when I was with the New York Yankees, my role was to pitch every out of every game that the outcome was already determined. Um, if we were down by 10 runs or we were up by 10 runs, we sure the heck didn't want to, to use Mariano Rivera and, and Mike Stanton and Jeff Nelson. That was my job to pitch the sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth innings and just get us, get us in the house with a win. Uh, and, you, you know, when I got to the Brewers, my, my reality was defined differently. I was pitching in seventh and eighth innings of much closer games um, because I, I had a, a higher, you know, spot on the totem pole. But, yeah, absolutely. The realities are different for the organization. At the end of the day, I, I'm, I'm just pitching. I mean, pitching is pitching, uh, but 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 understanding the expectation in New York is you win or we don't ever talk about it again. There there are no moral victories for the New York Yankees where with the Milwaukee Brewers, there were such things as some moral victories. Yeah. So with the Yankees, you were fortunate enough to play on a team that ultimately won a World Series. And there's a, a kind of a funny story uh, about your inclusion on the team photo for the, the 98 uh, championship team that I read about in an article that MLB had, had written about you not long ago. Uh, if you don't mind, share that with our audience. Yeah, so, um, you know, it's funny. Whether you're Chris Del Conte or, or Mike Buddy, you're an athletic director, and neither one of us feels like we have enough money in our budgets um, and, and we're both right. Um, and, and when I was with the New York Yankees, um, it's amazing how you get used to the, the industry that you're in. Um, I, I still think it's amazing that I get the opportunity to, to run an athletic department, but then there are days that you come to the office and you're like, Hey man, today's, it, it's a job today, right? There are tough decisions that we make and, and playing major league baseball was no different. Um, you know, it, I don't know 
when you pinpoint it, but there's obviously opportunities where you just come to work and you're like, man, this, today's going to be rough. So my rookie year, 1998, I literally was called up to the major leagues 10, 10, 10 separate times. Every time a pitcher got hurt, they called me up. And every time that pitcher was healthy, they sent me back down. And it was towards the end of the year, um, middle of August, I came up, I filled in for two weeks. I think I pitched like 14 innings and didn't give up, didn't give up any runs. I may not have given up a base runner. I, I pitched really, really well. And I remember thinking, you know what, I'm finally over the hump. September 1st is just a week away and the rosters expand then. So surely they're not going to send me down because I knew that Jeff Nelson was going to be healthy. And long story short, I came in, uh, you know, two hours early, like rookies do. And the clubhouse guy grabbed me and said, Hey, Joe wants to talk to you. And I went into his office and Joe said, Hey, you've, you've been pitching great. Um, Jeff Nelson's healthy. Here's your ticket. You're going back to meet the, the Columbus Clippers back down in Columbus. And I was frustrated and I, you know, I took the ticket and I went to my locker and I just started shoving stuff into my bag. And again, this is now the 11th time that I'm going back to AAA. And I throw the shoulder, the bag on my shoulder and I'm walking down the tunnels underneath the old Yankee stadium. Uh, it's kind of a labyrinth of, of, of alleyways and Daryl Strawberry's walking in as I'm walking out. And Daryl was, you know, I think he was 39 years old at that point, a veteran guy had, had been through all kinds of personal professional challenges and kind of had emerged to the other side. And we had, we had, you know, developed a, a, a relationship and he just said, Hey man, where are you going? And I said, I'm going back to AAA for the 10th damn time this year or something like that. And, and Daryl to his credit said, Hey Mike, uh, like, I understand you're, you're frustrated. I'm not going to stop you, but you know, today's team picture day. And, you know, at the time we were like 90 and 24 or something ridiculous. And he said, <laughs> you know, this team's pretty good. And you might want to be in this team picture because, you know, if, if things go like we think. So I turned back around and I went in and popped into Joe Torrey's office and said, hey, would you mind if I stayed for the picture? And he said, absolutely not. We'd love to have you in it. And, you know, I didn't have kids at the time. I was married. Um, but, you know, now I can go into any mall across America and there's the, the team picture, the 1998 Yankee team that won 125 games. Thank God I'm in there because, you know, I was I was so self self-absorbed and and having a pity party that of all people, Daryl Strawberry figuratively knocked me across the head and said, Hey man, you should be in this picture. So I'm, I'm grateful to this day. Uh, that's a great story. Hey, so Mike at, at every, every, regardless of, of your athletic prowess at every, in every story, there's an end right to your athletic career, whether it's in junior high, high school, collegiate ranks, professional ranks, whatever. And you, you had uh, Tommy John surgery and uh, that, ended up being a pivot pivotal moment in your career i think in 2003 and you ended up back at wake forest and had you thought coming out of professional baseball that athletic administration was the next step or did ron offer you an opportunity as you were talking about future how did that transpire yeah i did not have a plan uh, i wish i could tell you that i did um you know i think the blessing and the curse of being an athlete and and I was thinking of this watching Coach K as he was coaching Duke. None of us who are competitive, none of us think that our last game is going to be our last game um, because, you know, unless you're unless you announce your retirement and you win that the national championship or the World Series. So I got hurt. Um, I did Tommy John. I did the rehab. Um, you know, I had left Wake Forest after my junior year, Mike. And so part of the, the, the calculus that I did when I when I signed a professional contract was I better stow away enough money to pay for my last semester at Wake Forest. Um, you know, Wake Forest doesn't let you transfer credits in. I knew I was physically going to have to go back to Winston-Salem. Um, honestly, would have never thought that I was gonna be 34 years old and, and have played, you know, 12 seasons and, and been on a World Series team. So, uh, but that was my next step. I thought, holy crap, you know, I'm here I am, I'm 34. Now I do have a mortgage and a wife and two children. Um, I had to take 20 credit hours full-time at Wake Forest. You know, I, when I went the first time, I, I took a pencil and a notebook and I go back in 2004 and they handed me a laptop and I thought, what the heck is this? Yeah. Um, and George Greer, who was the coach when, when I played, was still there. And, and, and I said, coach, you know, I've got to feed my, my family. You know, I, I need a job. And he said, well, my contract expired, but if they renew it, you know, would you like to be my pitching coach? And I said, yes. And, and it's the, thank God I didn't do it because that would not have been a good fit for me. You know, coaches work so hard nights, weekends. I had done that for 13 years in professional baseball. You know, it's tough to call your wife when you're, 
you're in Los Angeles playing the Dodgers and it's two in the morning and you're at a, you're at a, a restaurant having a glass of wine and you know, she's got baby throwing up on her back at home. And so, so it was not time for me to get into coaching. Um, and I hadn't met Ron um, as a student athlete because he came to Wake Forest after I had left. Uh, I met him through Joe Girardi in, in my rookie year in New York City. It, Ron came to a Yankee event. And so, you know, Ron was kind enough to sit down with me. Um, to his credit, he, he kind of asked me what my plan was. And, and in my stupidity, I, I didn't have one. So I, so I graduated. I knew I needed transferable skills. Um, quite frankly, I, I knew that if I could get a foot in the door at a place like Wake Forest, that, that my work ethic w- would lead me to where I wanted to be. And, and I took a job as a fundraiser with the university, not in the athletic department. And it turned out to be very serendipitous because I learned how to, to raise money in true philanthropic ways. It wasn't connected to ACC tickets or 50 yard line seats. Um, I wasn't making much money. Uh, frankly, I was willing to bet on myself a little bit. And I think that's that's a theme that I talk about a lot is each generation seems less and less willing to bet on themselves. And I think we're seeing that in the transfer portal. Um, you know, instead of taking some tough coaching and and paying some dues, I think people are, are much more likely to, to kind of jump ship. And so, so I took that job raising money. Um, as luck would have it, Jim Grobe and, and the football team went on to win the ACC championship that year. And and an old classmate of mine, Barry Faircloth, who runs the Deacon Club, called me at the end of the year and said, hey, man, if you're going to be raising money for Wake Forest, like, why aren't you doing it for the athletic department? And so that was my foray into athletic um, development. Um, but even at that time, Mike, again, I was 35 or 36. I didn't really even know what an athletic director did. And so I was I was fortunate that I, I got in, my foot into the door in the organization that I believed in, but I had a long way to go uh, in terms of a learning curve. Yeah, and you spent 10 years at Wake there in, in mis- different, you know, increasing in administrative roles before becoming the AD at Furman. And uh, a great, great opportunity, by the way. Furman's a great school. Um, and you have probably some similarities, candidly, in terms of academic experience and the kind of student athletes that are attracted to, to maybe what Wake Forest was, was attracting. So that seemed to be a good segue, right, as the next step? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it felt it felt comfortable. It felt like home. Um, you know, Greenville, South Carolina is just a wonderful place to live. Furman, Furman. You know, a lot of people call Furman Wake with a lake because it, it it has a very similar feel and it's got a lake on campus. But it was a great place for me, you know, to take the lessons that I learned from from so many uh, to get your first opportunity to be an athletic director. And and frankly, I was able to screw up in relative peace. You know, I mean. Athletics are very important everywhere, um, but you know when we're, we're in the shadow of, of the Clemson Tigers down there in Greenville, and so when I made a, a good decision or a bad decision, you know the president certainly was aware, but but it wasn't like you know I was making bad decisions and it was a world of Twitter storm because you know the the Furman uh, fan base has a has a pretty uh, level-headed expectation, and so it was a great opportunity for me to learn, cut my teeth, uh, to, have, to to make those decisions that athletic directors have to make day in day out really. Yeah, so you get the opportunity to, to come to Army West Point, and I, I just have to say this, you know, for those of us, so those who are maybe listening to this podcast and they are not watching the podcast, you're sitting in front of an American flag, right? There's something special about being one of the military academies, and certainly the, the, the history of the institution itself is off the charts, and then there's this rich athletic history as well. Um, what as, athlete, as an athletic director, when you hear the words duty, honor, country, and you're sitting in your role that you are right now, how does that resonate with you? What, what do you think when I say those words? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a heavy weight. Um, you know, I probably interviewed for seven or eight athletic director jobs, and, and every time that I do, I, I talk about the role of the athletics department is to expand and support the mission of the institution. And, and, and it's true. And every job, I was completely sincere, but, but the mission here is different. Um, it's palpable. It's tangible. You know, we don't, we don't honor all Americans uh, in the same way that, that other schools might honor all Americans. You walk into our locker rooms, and most of them are honored, um, you know, those killed in action. And so there is a, there is a heavy understanding and expectation um, that, that we need to do things the right way. 
and again, everybody says it, but but the culture here, Mike, is is such a culture of correction and a culture of truth telling. Um, you know, I'm I've got two teenage kids, and you know, it's easy to to pick and choose your battles. And what I love about West Point is you don't pick and choose your battles. You fight every single one of them. And so if it's if your belt buckle is crooked, if you haven't shaved, you know, people don't walk by and, and let it go. And, and while sometimes that annoys me, um, I certainly understand and respect uh, everybody who, who has been in this chair. You know, I'm, I'm fortunate to have followed Hugh Corrigan, who really brought this athletic department into the, into the, the, the new age, much more sophisticated than it was for a long time before Rick Greenspan and, and Kevin Anderson. It was just a colonel that they brought in to run the athletic department. And when that colonel's orders were up and, and he or she had to go to Germany or Korea, it was just the next person in the seat. And so we're still relatively young as, a, as an athletic department. Um, but, you know, uh, a friend of mine who was another athletic director said it beautifully. And he said, you know, our athletic budget probably represents 5% of the overall institution's budget, but we represent 90% of the institutional risk. And, and that's what I... Uh, espouse daily to my staff. That's what we feel every day. You know, we have fallen short when, when, when a cadet makes a bad decision, it reflects on something a hell of a lot bigger than, than just an athletic department. And so um, it's a responsibility, but, but the trade-off is we work with young people who wake up every morning at, you know, five o'clock. They don't look at their cell phones. They're not checking social media accounts. You know, they're getting up, they're saying, yes, sir, no, sir. They're making their bed. And they have chosen this lifestyle, and it's a it's a great responsibility, and it's it's a great uh, battery recharger for those of us who get the opportunity to work at an academy. You know, and I, I think this to you will come across as an elementary question, Mike, but but I, we have to be reminded that there's some that just don't understand the the differences of, of daily life there as a student athlete, and you know there are immense pressures on student athletes, regardless of where you are in terms of you know film study and proper nutrition and and you know, all the practice, you know, competition, et cetera, et cetera. But there, there, there are extras that come alongside being a student athlete at West Point. And for, for those who maybe aren't as familiar with that, would you mind just sharing what a day looks like for a student athlete at your place? Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, it starts early. Uh, there, are no, there are no exceptions. And in a lot of ways, it makes my job right now probably easier than than just about every job in the country, right? Name, image, and likeness does not and cannot apply to active duty service men and women. And that is how our cadets and the midshipmen and Air Force cadets are, are deemed. So, so they're not getting paid for their name, image, and likeness. It is a 47 month experience. Whether the NCAA says you get one, two, three, or five more years of eligibility, that, that doesn't pertain to us. And so, uh, you know, we don't have the opportunity of our of our lacrosse goalkeepers getting extra work at 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, from, from 6 a.m. until 3 o'clock every day, they are focused on academic and military training. And so the dean, who is a one-star general, focuses and runs the academic program. Another one-star general is our commandant of cadets, and he is uh, tasked with military readiness, um, which is always important, but even more important now with, with, with what's going on in Russia and the Ukraine military readiness has a whole different meaning for us. And so, so when I interview coaches, for example, I, I make it clear to them that, hey, it might be the, the morning of the Patriot League soccer championship, and two of your best players might have to do a 12 mile ruck march through the forest with a 50 pound rucksack on their back, and don't ask to get out of it because they're not gonna get out of it. They'll do the, they'll do the 12 mile ruck march and they'll go to class and maybe take a nap and they'll be ready to go. Um, and so. We might be competing against teams that are getting 20 hours of, of practice or summer school opportunities. And you're not going to have the same amount of opportunities to coach your team. Um, but we think we make it up through grit and tenacity and resilience and just flat out toughness. Um, uh, in some sports, it's a little bit easier uh, to toughen your way to victory uh, than others. Um, but yeah, they are pretty focused until three o'clock. It is military academic focus. And then, and then we get them for three hours, and then they've got to be back down the hill for mandatory dinner um, by 1900, uh, seven, seven o'clock. I, I, I'm actually, I'm drinking the Kool-Aid. I'm, I'm using military <laughs> time now. 
Um, yeah. You know, and then they've got and then they've got to get their studying, right? I mean, there is, is a STEM heavy curriculum, so a lot of physics, a lot of nuclear engineering and, and math classes. So um, it's a full day. And, and sadly, the one thing that, that usually falls to the wayside is, is sleep. And, you know, you and I both know how important that is to young people. And, and that's a precious commodity. And it's just, a, it's tougher to come by. But strangely, the cadets don't complain about it. They don't complain that that the Gatorade's the wrong color or the Powerade doesn't taste right. You know, they're filling their canteens on a water buffalo that doesn't have ice cubes in it and it's probably rainwater. And it's just a, it's a unique uh, group of, of young people to work with. So one of the things I, you know, I observed this past week when you and I were at the, the, the NACTA Spring Symposium, there was this conversation around, you know, you are a civilian employee of, the, of West Point. The, do you have a military employed deputy AD or associate AD on your staff? much like was discussed out there in San Diego? Yes, I do. So, so I have an active duty, cur- active duty colonel, um, and, and he provides um, advice, um, oversight. You know, his job uh, is to, to maintain the culture of, of the United States Military Academy. And so he sits on my senior staff. He is in every meeting that I have of substance um, because he thinks of everything through the lens of the military. For example, apparel partners right i mean we're negotiating apparel deal it's usually hey is it a, is it a reliable brand and and what are the dollars and cents you know his job is to make sure he's done a deep dive do they have any political leanings that could be difficult for our alumni base um you know are they tested you know he, he's concerned with the health and safety of our cadets and so yeah he's uh he the current deputy military ad colonel tony bianchi is a former football player which is very uh, very helpful because he understands um, the, the day-to-day life of cadets. But he's also, I mean, he's, his job is to slap me upside the head from time to time and say, <laughs> hey, that, that might work at Furman, but that's not going to work here. Um, and he's empowered to do that by not just me, but the superintendent. And it's very valuable as we, you know, because I still see things through the lens of, of Wake Forest and Furman. Um, and I've been here three years now, and I should, uh, I should be, a lo- you know, they should be able to leave me alone in the room, um, but it's always nice to have that deputy AD on my shoulder, um, making sure that that he's approving the, the the not just the the decisions I make, but the logic behind the decisions I make. All right, so rapid fire round. I'm just going to ask you three questions. Uh, you can give me short responses to this, to the extent that you can give short responses. You may need to expound on a couple of things, but um, you know, to most people, Army Navy football game is a bucket list item. What's your favorite moment from Army Navy uh, that you've experienced since becoming athletic director? Wow. Um, so my second Army Navy game uh, was during the pandemic. Philadelphia was unable to host in their stadium. Um, the one absolute was the entire Corps of Cadets and the entire brigade of midshipmen was going to be in attendance. In Philadelphia, through no fault of their own, was unable unable to do that, and so we hosted the game here at Mikey Stadium for the first time since 1943, uh, and it happened to fall on my 50th birthday, and we won the game. Um, so that was that was an easy one. Yeah, all right. So I think you've served, or you maybe you're still currently serving as chair of the NCAA baseball committee. I know you you've been on the committee. I, I think that there we've seen a real movement in fan interest around in the NCAA baseball, uh, NCAA baseball in general, and certainly around the Omaha, uh, the World Series in, in Omaha. Um, what's your perspective on where NCAA baseball is now in terms of, of fan interest? Well, yeah, it's, it's at an all-time high. Um, you know, you certainly, the SEC, the ACC, the Pac-12, the Big 12, you know, the Power Five leagues, you know, the, the Big Ten has some challenges with weather. You know, they have to play so many games on the road. But it's in a good spot. You know, we, we are all concerned. Uh, you know, I am the chair currently. We do talk a lot about pace of play and, and the length of games. Um, you know, again, I, I mentioned my own children. You know, it's the, the attention span of, of this generation of, of young person is not what it was. And so to, to, to have a sport that I love um, that can sometimes take four hours, is a concern and so we're, we're trying to be creative we're trying to speed it along um, we have not cracked the code just yet um, but it is a 
a phenomenally healthy sport. You know, Omaha was another bucket list for me um, that I, I didn't take advantage of until I was on the committee. And so it's a phenomenal experience. It's a, it's a, it's a great sport. You know, it's, it's one of those sports again, in this day of name, image and likeness and, you know, football and basketball players, every one of them on a full scholarship, you know, baseball is different. Most kids, most kids are paying 65, 70% uh, of their own way for the, for the opportunity and the privilege of playing college baseball. And they just keep getting better and better. You know, I, I threw 93 miles an hour a couple times at Wake Forest and got drafted in the fourth round. I wouldn't even like make a team right now. Everybody's throwing 97. <laughs> it's just, it's amazing the, uh, the physical advancements of the game. Yeah, I saw the other day, I guess a kid from Tennessee had hit 103 or something. You know, that's pretty, pretty phenomenal, right? Um, yeah, so one of your bios says you served as the pitching coach for Kevin Costner in the movie For the Love of the Game. Is it true? Was he coachable? And does he have a curveball? Yeah, it's true. You know, that might be, that might be um, maybe taking some poetic license. I mean, I was, I was <laughs> cast uh, to be the opposing pitcher in that movie and, and Kevin uh, in, you know, his humility and, and I, I think um, professional intelligence, you know, did call me over and say, Hey, here's what I'm thinking. Like, would, would a major league player do this? Um, you know, and this was, this was Kevin on the, uh, the, the, the later side, this isn't Bull Durham, Kevin, you know, this is, yeah. this is after dances with wolves, Kevin, um, still very athletic. Absolutely. Uh, he loves baseball, um, had a curveball, had a legitimate curveball. Um, and so it was a lot of fun and that was the 98 season. So, you know, that was my rookie year. Um, got a chance to, to be on that team that went on to win the world series. And then for the off season job, I, I'm employed by universal studios. And I still get a, a a check from the Screen Actors Guild every few months for like eleven dollars. <laughs> My retirement account. Uh, that's great. Couple of cups of coffee, right? That's um, right. Hey, Mike, this has been great. I I really do appreciate you taking out the the, the time to talk to us a little bit about your career and your most specifically your time at West Point. And um, and thanks for for all you're doing there to to in your role help serve our country and the student athletes that are going to serve our country. I uh, appreciate you being with me. My pleasure, Mike. I appreciate you having me. Thanks for all you do. Same. All right. So you've been listening from the chair with Mike Hamilton. My guest today has been Mike Buddy, who's the director of athletics at Army West Point. We thank him for joining us. Uh, we'll hope to see you next week, folks. Take care. Have a good one.